Wonderful way to celebrate. Okay, today is the last day of our sermon series called Growing in Groups, and we're going to be talking about the family, and we're going to do something that I've not, I don't, I think maybe I've done once before, not with Amy. This is uh, Amy Cherboni, Pastor Amy and Pastor Herman. Run our, run our NC kids, and uh, so we're going to be tag teaming today, so this will be interesting. We had fun first service, and so... Um, So here we go. So we're going to talk about the family, God's original group. Healthy things grow and people are not any different. Some growth can happen independently by ourselves. But God created us for community and the best way to grow is to belong to a group of people that love you as you and receive your unique contribution to the world with joy. You can grow individually like in prayer. But you cannot grow individually in patience. Patience needs difficult people to grow in your life, right? So we grow individually, but we can also grow as a group. And so today we'll finish up that sermon series. So we're going to talk about God, the family, God's original group. Amen. So our first point is that the family was created to glorify God, right? We're to glorify God as individuals, but even as a family unit, we can worship him and we can glorify him. And our scripture comes out of Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 1. It says, These are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and your grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving to you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road in your car and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on the forehead, on your forehead as a reminder. So our first point is that we were created as a family to glorify the Lord. And we're going to look at the triune family. And you're probably asking, what's a triune family? It just simply means that the family, the Trinity, is also a model for the family. We can look at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and see a beautiful depiction of what the family is. So first thing we're going to talk about is God the Father which I just love. And God the Father represents parents, that parents are a representation of God. In other words, to their kids, their parents model what God looks like, what God is supposed to be like. And so we have a a weighty um, responsibility as parents to make sure we're modeling the God of the Bible, amen, a God of love and grace and mercy. And so I know sometimes in in the past church history, we've talked about this here in NCC. I've got my little basket of goodies because when we have kids, we have to have object lessons. And so um, sometimes we've viewed God as a judge, a harsh judge who wants to punish us or crush us. And we see him up there maybe on his throne with his gavel, you know, declaring guilty, guilty. But when I see the God, uh, the God the Father, the God of the Bible, I see a God who like pursues us and runs after us all through scripture. Amen. He is like pursuing us because he wants a love relationship with us. So I think we need to make sure we're modeling God the Father in an appropriate way. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Nick has been talking about a name for God lately, right? He keeps talking about how God's name is love, Love. that it is love, that, yes, God is just, and he is fair, and he does, um, we do have consequences, but that's encompassed and surrounded by, first and foremost, the love of God. It's his character. It's who he is is. And you know what? In our family, as parents, um, as siblings, we need to make sure we're modeling love more than judgment. Amen? Um, I don't know if you struggled with this, but when I was young and Josiah was little, he's our first one, so he was like our guinea pig because we didn't know what we were doing, right? Right. It's at all. Woo, winging it. And so so, um, we didn't have a a gavel in our house. Instead, we had something called Mr. Pow Pow Spin. Mr. Pow Pow. Okay, Mr. Pow Pow. Oh, Mr. Pow Pow. Right. Mr. Pow Pow came in all varieties, shapes, and colors in our house. <laughs> he was in the kitchen. He was in my diaper bag. He was yeah. lock and load on my side, you know, like yeah. in my belt loop, ready yeah. whenever a poor Josiah, okay, <laughs> compared to my third child, Elijah. Woo! And so, um, so I didn't realize that 
at that point that I was breeding fear more than I was fostering a relationship, a love relationship with my child. Um, I had my own issues and my own insecurities, and I just didn't understand at that point. Not that there's not a place for, for Mr. Pow Pow kids. You know, their discipline is called for sometimes, but we need to make sure it's covered and embraced and saturated with love, amen, and that we're modeling first and foremost the love of our Heavenly Father. So Father God does two things for us. does a lot more than two things, but I'm just going to hit on these two. First, he speaks life into us. He is creator God, right? In Genesis, we see him breathing into Adam and Eve and breathing life and speaking to us. All throughout the Bible, he calls us names. He says, chosen, you're righteous, you're, um, you're the apple of my eye. He calls me pumpkin. I'm um, his pumpkin, you know? So, yeah. so we, the God is always talking to us and speaking life to us. And as a family, we need to make sure we're fostering between our husbands and wives, between our children, between brothers and sisters, that we speak life to each other. And we need to be really intentional on that because that life breeds life, you know? And we just need to be really cautious that we are modeling that after God the Father. And then second, he sacrifices for us, amen? He sent Jesus, his one and only son, to die for us and to rise again for us so we could have a relationship with him. And so when I thought of sacrifice... I shared this in first service. I thought of the word bedtime, okay? And I don't know if you equate sacrifice with bedtime, but when you have little kids, <laughs> um, and we homeschool our children, and so we're with them since birth, like all the time. They don't, they don't go away. You know, I teach them at home and we come to the church and uh, we're a team at the church and we work at the church. And so, so bedtime, I would be like counting down the hours, guys. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, it's three o'clock. I got 3.5 hours to go. I can make it, especially when they were little. And I had this song and I'm going to sing it to you too. Um, the Rocky song, y'all who like Rocky, right? Okay. Dun, na, 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 right. I would start singing this to myself midway through the day so I could get to bedtime. I would be like, I'd run, no joke, I would run around the house, Nick. I know I'm just, I'm just laying it all out there. But I would circle around my kitchen and I would jog and I would sing, you are great. You are mom. That's why you sing the Rocky song. You can do algebra and wash dishes. You can vacuum the floor and do the, I would just make up all these lyrics, okay? But I'd pump myself. I'd speak life to myself because I needed it just to get to bedtime. But then my kids started growing up. And they, um, they wanted to talk at bedtime, okay, Tina? Like, they wanted to have these deep, long conversations with me. And I'm like, it's bedtime. It's bedtime. And so I just learned, I, Jesus just started talking to me about sacrifice and God the Father. And he just said, you've got to be willing to sacrifice because they're opening their heart to you. They're bearing their souls, and you might not get this moment again. So you need to, to relish this moment and just cherish this moment. So, so we see that with God the Father. He's, um, he speaks life to us, and he sacrifices uh, for us. And then we've got God the Son, right? That's Jesus. And Jesus is amazing because he represents parents are the primary disciples of their kids because he was an amazing discipler right? He had children, 12 kids. He hung out with all day long. He spent all of his time with them, and he models for us how we should disciple our kids. And I just want to say, you know, in church culture, sometimes people have relinquished um, discipling your children to the church, but the Bible says in Deuteronomy, what we read, that it's our job as parents to talk about Jesus, to model Jesus, to share about the Father all the time, whether we're awake or we're asleep. And so it's very important that we just get your munchkins, you know, a few hours a week, but it's really you who do the hard job every day. And we just partner with you and just kind of encourage what's already going on at home. So Jesus um, discipled his disciples by spending lots of time with him, right? They were always, always together. And I think of that, I think of date nights, even though I spend all my time with my kids. Um, it's not really individual time because we're doing math or whatever, history. And so we've been really purposeful, Herman, Adam, and I, to date our children and to take them on individual dates. We schedule it in our calendar on Tuesday nights that we take one out each um, each week, and we've had to put a little cap on it, because some of my munchkins will, like, throw down $200 in one date, you know, and I'm like, I was thinking, like, a milkshake at Chick-fil-A, you know, yeah, yeah. like, three ninety nine, dollars not uh -huh. going to New York Broadway, you know, on yeah. a plane or something like that, yeah. so, so, um, but we are purposeful to spend individual time just to hang out and to have fun with them, and that's what Jesus did, and then second, Jesus was amazing at creating teachable moments wherever he went, like, if you read the gospel, 
Gospels, he's there, and, like, they're walking by a fig tree, and he's like, bam, he pulls out some kingdom truth from this fig tree, and you're like, how did I, I didn't even see that there. Mm -hmm. So we, as parents and as families, got to make sure we're fostering teachable moments. So I was like, hey, who's a good person to ask for teachable moments except Nick, you know, because he's already, his kids are grown. He must know what he's doing. You know? <laughs> so. I honestly thought at 18 we were done. <laughs> the, the, it's forever. It's forever. Now, one, now, she asked me for just one quick example, and one of the things that we did when we, were, when we were younger is I wanted to teach the boys how to treat women. I wanted the boys to understand how to have uh, manners, and so I said, okay, boys, until you get your own woman, you can borrow mine for a little while, <laughs> and, and what we will do is... She'll never touch a car door. She'll never touch the door to a restaurant. She'll never touch a chair. What I'm asking you to do is whenever she gets near the car, you open the car door so she can get in, and then you close it for her. And when, she gets, when we get to where we're going, you open the car door. Then you walk your mother to the door, and one of you guys needs to open the door. And, and, and ladies, ladies, as a man, I'm teaching my sons how to be men, but you can also teach men how to be men. And that is you just, when you get to the door, you just stop. And then he walks in, and five minutes later, he realizes he's by himself. And he comes back out to see what's wrong. And you're like, there was a door, and it was closed, and I didn't know what to do, for I had no one to open it for me. You will train them very quick, and they will do it if you demand it of them. In fact, it's a good time for you to look at them and say, I don't know what your last girlfriend was like, but I ain't her. I'm sorry, I'm off the outline. <laughs> um, and so when we go in the restaurant, we say, Mom, where would you like? I love it when the waitresses try to tell us where we're going to sit. I'm like, no, no, she decides where we sit. We're paying for this. We don't want to sit over there by the kitchen. We want to sit by the window up front. And so then we go and say, pull her chair out for her, give her the menu, let her order first. And I want to tell you, of all the things, that, of anything that my sons have spoken to me personally, they said, Dad, thank you for teaching us how to treat women said it has benefited us as men because there's no competition out there doing that kind of stuff. And so I, that's, that's just something teachable. In fact, they did it so well for so long, when they left the house, I had almost forgotten how to do all those things because <laughs> they were constantly doing it. And Tina would be standing there at the door. And I'm like, oh, oh, I got it, I got it. I love it. So good, so good. Go home and teach Josiah. Um, so, yeah, that Jesus was always great at creating teachable moments. But he was also really good at giving opportunity for his disciples to practice what he taught. You know, if he taught about um, delivering people from demons, he would teach it, and then they'd go actually practice on people, right, and practice healing. And so it's the same with our kids. We need to be intentional about creating opportunities for them to grow in that gift. So if we're going to teach something, we need to um, – we need to um, uh, enforce it through practice. And so I was thinking, when I think of intentional, I always say that's the word of my life. I want to be intentional with everything that I do. I think of weight loss, okay? Like, if you want to lose weight, you've got to be purposeful. You've got to be intentional. You have to be willing to go on a diet, work out, go to the gym. And for a while there, my weight loss plan was just to pray at night for supernatural weight loss. <laughs> like, Jesus, come on. Just melt the pounds yeah. off as I sleep. Yeah. I'll wake up skinny, and I'll give you all the praise and all the glory. All the I will make sure people know glory. that I got skinny through Jesus, you know? But it didn't happen like that, right, kids? It does not happen. You have to be intentional. Mm. And so it's the same with mm. our kids, guys. In NC Kids, with your children, we are intentional with them. If we teach them about laying on of hands, we actually lay hands on, on someone. We go find sick people in the church. We bring them back to kids' church, and we lay hands, and they pray practice praying. They practice hearing the voice of God. If we're talking about hearing the voice of God, we sit down and we listen for his voice and then we say what we've heard. And if we'll just do those simple things of, of just practicing that, it really hits a home run in their hearts of, of what that looks like and is modeled for. So we see God the Father and then we see the God the Son and then we see the Holy Spirit. Okay? Woo woo! Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit represents parents releasing their children. When you think about Jesus, right, and he ascended to heaven, he gave us the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to us. And I think if 
God, the Father, if God is willing to trust us with the Holy Spirit, then we have got to trust the Holy Spirit with our children. That's right. Amen. We have got to entrust the Holy the Holy Spirit to take our children. And so when I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of all the character that he is. Think of um, the fruit, love and joy and peace. I think of his gifts like faith and healing. And I think of the traits, like the things I want my kids to take with them when they leave my house. Tr- um, truthfulness, honoring women. Um, righteousness, purity, integrity. So for this um, this illustration, I'm going to have Pastor Nick come up to the front. And so <laughs> he just loves to be volunteered for. <laughs> oh, that's his favorite thing. And so we're going to pretend, guys, that Pastor Nick is, is not Pastor Nick anymore. We're going to pretend he's little Nick, okay? We're going to pretend that Pastor Nick's about five years old, all right? And I'm going to be mama. To Nick, okay? I'm going to be the mama in this situation. I know, this is really good. And so, <laughs> and so this rope represents our relationship. It represents our trust. And as I'm building relationship with you, so last time I had a hard time with the rope too. I don't know. Help me out here. Let's do this one. Five-year-old. Yeah. yeah, okay. So when, I, when Pastor Nick is little and he's five years old, I'm going to give him a little bit of rope, right? We're just building trust and just building responsibility. So mama's going to be real close to Pastor Nick because we're not sure. Baby, little Nick. Little Nick. Because yeah. we're not sure what Nick is going to do, right? <laughs> you know, we're not sure what a five-year-old might do. But as Nick grows into a boy and then he grows into a young man and then eventually a man, the rope gets longer and longer and longer. And on my rope, I have things that I'm trying to teach our children, right? Purity and teachableness, integrity. And just like Jesus with his disciples, he invested in them. He had a relationship with them. There came a time where... It, It was time for him to leave. So he gathered up that rope, right, guys? He gathered it all up, and just like us, and he handed it to his disciples. Just like we are going to hand to our children one day everything that we've invested in them and been intentional about them, and then we've got to release. We've got to let the Holy Spirit do his job because he is so good at his job, guys. He knows our kids better than what even we could, and he can take them to that next level. So he is just amazing. So we need to grow as as in glorifying God through the through the Trinity. High five. <laughs> So we also, my, my second point is understand uniqueness. I, and you've heard me talk about this. There's two pillars that I believe to parenting. And I believe the first is establishing an environment of unconditional love. That, that's, that's the battleground that, that we have to fight for as parents. That we provide a safe place in our home that the people that live in our home know they are loved unconditionally. You know, we know, I, I thought parenting was over at 18, but after they grow up, they start making decisions on their own. And some of those decisions are decisions I wouldn't make. But in those moments, we have a chance to love them for who they are, not for their behavior. They want to know, if you don't approve of my behavior, will you still love me as a person? So the first most important thing we can do is unconditional. Think about us for a second. How many times we've had bad choices And yet Papa God did not stop loving us. He kept chasing us. And that's the love he wants us to show our kids, no matter what they do, that we love them. But the second thing is that we help them understand their uniqueness. We help them find how they're uniquely different from everyone else. I I, I didn't know we had a Mr. Papa, but, um, (laughs) but one of the keys about parenting is we have to parent each child differently because they all respond differently in different environments. For instance... Caleb, our oldest son, probably experienced Mr. Paw Paul no more than five times his entire life. Five times. All you had to do is look at him, and he felt bad, and he didn't want to do that anymore. I guarantee you there were days that Mr. Paw Paw visited the rear end of Hayden Luke, our second son, at least five times in one day. <laughs> five times in a day. I mean, it was totally different. In fact, one time we had bought Hayden some candy, And he did something bad, and I said, okay, you can't have your candy. And he says, if you spank me, can I have my candy? (laughs) He he would rather have a spanking than to lose his rights of candy. And and so because all of us are different, and all of us are unique. I mean, I, I think about God the Father, the great creator of everything that we see. And I think about the galaxies and the moons and stars and planets, and none of them are alike. He, he doesn't run out of creativity. 
I think about, I think about that every one of our fingertips, our fingerprints are different. Did you know, do you all, does anybody in the room have identical twins in anywhere in your world and in your life? Anybody? You, if you have identical twins in your world, I have some identical twins around me that I can't tell the difference between which is, who is who. I can't even tell. But even identical twins have different fingerprints. They're unique in that way. So I was thinking about snowflakes, and I was thinking about how snowflakes are formed, and they're, they're formed from, from three things. There's dust particle that comes from the earth, or it comes from volcanic ash, uh, or meteorites, or whatever. You have dust particle in the air, and there's water vapor, and if it's cold enough, that turns into to ice crystals, and those three things, dust, water vapor, and ice crystals, come together to form a snowflake. And what's really intriguing is if, if a cloud is producing snowflakes, all the snowflakes will be identical. They are all formed as hexagon, six-sided snowflakes while in the cloud. But watch this. According to, I, I just love the name of this website, Wonderopolis. Wonderopolis. <laughs> Wonderopolis. <laughs> According to Wonderopolis, even though two snowflakes may form in the same cloud, their different journeys to the ground will affect their shape and size, giving each snowflake its own unique identity. Even if we are formed the same, our journey makes us unique. It makes us different, and it gives us our unique identity. Isn't that cool? So, so here's the thing about that. It is that we are, here's the dichotomy we live in. We have to teach our kids that we're all alike. And then we have to teach them that we're all different. We have to say, you're a human being, and we're all alike. We all need food. We all need shelter. We all need water. We all need clothing. We all need love. We all need to belong. We all have certain basic needs, and that helps us connect with the rest of humanity. If we don't teach that, we lose compassion for other people and because we, we, rec- we, we think that we're different than them when all of us have struggles. All of us have issues. We're all processing through something, and one of the jobs of a parent is to teach that we're all the same. But then as parents, our job is to teach, but you're uniquely different than anyone who's ever been created before. There's something about you that Papa had in his heart before he formed you that he wanted to express to the world that is brilliant, that is beautiful, that is glorious. And I'm here to help you find that. So how do we do that? There's a couple ways. One, point out their uniqueness. When they do something unique, when, they, when they're able to do something that the other kids don't do, point it out and show it to them. I was telling first service that when we took Hayden and Luke down to Lake Junaluska to teach him how to ride his bike in the big parking lot down there by the chapel, we took him down there to ride his bike and learn how to ride his bike. And I don't know, he was six or seven years old. He's a little guy. And somehow we got to talking and I had his bike and I looked over and he was flirting with two 11-year-old girls. And they were flirting back. So I was like, hey, 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 here's an area we might want to keep an eye on. And, uh, and he's always been, you know, that's been very easy for him to connect with people. He's, he's a networker. And, and from a little kid, he, one of the uniquenesses about Hayden is, is when he was in elementary school, they would, they would always assign him to work with a, uh, a mentally challenged kid because he had great compassion and loved folks who were struggling with a disability. And that was what they always assigned. Every year they found Hayden, looks at Hayden, make him, and, Fra- and Hayden would go make him one of the coolest kids in the school. Because that's what he does, right? That's how unique he is. So one is pointing out uniqueness to our kids. Now, parents, unfortunately, we're masters at pointing out where they're broken or where they misbehave or what's bad in their life. Don't tell me you can't do it because you do do it. You know what I'm saying? Don't tell me you can't point out their brilliance because we do point out where they're lacking. And we got to tone that down a little bit and find some positive things and build in them the positive things that God's made them to be. The second thing is name those things. It helps form their identity if they can name those things. My son, our son Caleb, our oldest son, um, his, his wife's name is Cece. So one of the highlights of our life as parents happened this last month. One of the great payoffs of all time as parents happened in the last month. This is what happened. We went on and looked at his Facebook page. And he had described himself this way. Jesus, period. Cece, period. Music, period. Coffee, period. 
Drop the mic. <laughs> no, no, knows who he is, right? right? No, no, no. When you, if you can help your kids name who they are, so that they don't get be pulled around by everybody else who's trying to do something, get on the bandwagon, you know, follow the crowd. Be no, we want them to stand out and know who they are, and we. As parents have an opportunity to name them so they know who they are and they know who they're not. And the last thing that you can do with that is set up opportunities for them to see their brilliance. If you know your child is good at, in, in art, take them to an art gallery and say, I, I don't want to just say that you're good at art. I want to set up opportunities for your brilliance to shine. If you're good at music, get them music lessons. Help them. The more you help them find their individuality, the less the crowd will pull on them, the less that they'll be sucked into being average and toned down. We want them to be brilliant. Now, there may be people in the room today say, I've raised my kids, you know, I'm glad we're having, you know, family Sunday, but, but how does this apply to me? The kingdom is starving for spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. Families are starving for, for, for grandparents to help adopt their kids. And it works in the spirit just like it works in the natural you can speak life into somebody else's kid if you'll spend enough time with them to know who they are and be able to do that. But that's part of our job is to be able to recognize their uniqueness and celebrate that with them. Amen. I love that. So our third point is that the family teaches us interpersonal interaction, okay? And I will say that I didn't know what that was in the first <laughs> when we first started coming up with the sermon, but that just basically means that the family is training ground for civilization. It's where you learn all your interpersonal skills, like communication, uh, decision-making, conflict resolution. We learn it with our relationships with our moms and dads, with our brothers and sisters. We definitely learn conflict resolution, right, with brothers and sisters and hanging out with them. And so I was trying to think of a, an illustration, an object that would represent where we can learn some of these skills in our family. And I thought about the table. I thought about like your kitchen table, your dining room table, where you guys go to have um, dinner every night or, or um, you know, wherever you eat at. And so it's there at the table that God does so much in our hearts and our lives. I think of our own kids and all the memories I have sitting around the table as we eat and as we talk, we're teaching our kids communication skills, right? As we play games, we love to play um, spoons, all right, when our teenagers come over, spoons and different games like that, Egyptian rat screw and all the kinds of great games. And so it's like, we love to play games and that's teaching teamwork. And I say, if I have to play a game with just Herman Adam and myself, that's teaching me conflict resolution. Okay. <laughs> because I'm not competitive at all. I, I don't, you know, I'm not competitive at all, except when it comes to Herman Adam and me, when it's just the two of us. And I'm like, oh man, I've got to win. I've got to win. It also teaches me self-control. Yes. I don't necessarily win all the time. And he, and he doesn't let me win, even though he should. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyway, and then you, te you teach your kids, too, when we're sitting at the, the dining room table, right, doing finances. Oh, that's a huge lesson in conflict resolution right there, right? When you're doing your budget, your kids are watching that, and, and they're a part of that. And so the table just represents that time where you spend with your kids, and the family is so important to build those skills. And I think sometimes maybe we're busy. Maybe we don't sit at the table as much as we used to. But even in the car, if you're driving in your car, and I was trying to think of a healthy um, fast food uh, um, during the break. I said McDonald's first service, but I don't even know if we have a healthy fast food. But whatever you're eating in your car, you know, you're driving through a drive through and you're eating... Um, Turn off the, the radio, turn, have the kids put down their phones and spend some time talking, talk about decision making, talk about their life, just build those skills together. I just feel like it's so important that the family embraces that and really pours into our next generation what that looks like. And I would say what Pastor um, Nick said was so true about grandparents, that grandparents, if we thought our job was over when our kids left our house and they started having babies, it's not. Because what does De Deuteronomy say? Deuteronomy 6.2 said that all these commands, what we're supposed to do, eating and sleeping and talking with our kids and walking on the road, that's for you, your children, and your grandchildren. Because God thinks generationally. Amen? He's an intergenerational God. And he has a generational mindset. And he's we're on our generation, but he's four generations ahead of us. And he's always thinking about how it's going to affect the next generation. And so grandparents, um, or even if you don't have grandkids, maybe you're, you're single or maybe you never had children, you can be a 
surrogate grandparent, mm -hmm. but it's your job to pour in to your grandchildren. And I see the beauty of this in my own life. When I look at how God has redeemed my childhood through my parents becoming grandparents, okay? So when, when my kid, when, um, when I was growing up, I got to say, I was a handful, okay? I was a handful. I was a lot for my mama and daddy to handle, okay? And uh, no, I know. It's true. And so, hard and to believe. So it is. It's really hard to believe. Hard to believe. And so my daddy had not been parented. He didn't have a father modeled for him. So he was just trying the best he could, right? I mean, you just try the best you can when you don't really know what you're, what you're doing. And so through my, my childhood, I didn't have a lot of relationship with them. But when they became grandparents, all of a sudden, now we live close only two hours away. They live in Boone. And so we're going to see them, and they're spending time with my kids. They're dating my kids. They're in the garden, gardening. And God is redeeming all those years that I lost with my parents through them grandparenting, the grand, um, grandparenting their own grandchildren. And I think it's a beautiful thing, guys. And I think we've got to get out of the box that um, that's just for that family. If you are uh, single, if you're a widow, um, if you can be an aunt or uncle, we have children, like what Pastor Nick said, in and see kids that are desperate for other family members. We've got to extend our table. Mm -hmm. Maybe our table's been a little small. We've got to stretch it out and let others come and join our table to help our kids grow in these skills. And you could very well redeem a legacy of another family and not even know it just by pouring in to and building relationship with, um, with our children and with our body as a whole. Amen. Good job. I've been wanting one of these for a long, long time. <clears throat> particularly, particularly with the ability to pull people over on the highway that were not driving appropriately. Oh, I've wanted that. That's why you won't let me have it, because I want it so bad. I got that at the 99 cent store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so the last point of our sermon is honor authority. Um, one of, the, one of the jobs of parents is to teach their children how to honor authority. Romans 13 says that all authority is established by God. God is the one that came up with the idea of authority. And God operates through direct authority directly to us, but then he also operates through delegated authority. And one of our jobs is to teach kids to recognize authority. If you're 40 years old or older, I guarantee you, you can think of somebody you've known for most of your life that was not disciplined as a kid, not disciplined as a teen, not disciplined early in their adult life, and today is in trouble with the law because they don't respect and honor authorities, right? Most or everybody in the room that's over 40 could think of, they could see it coming. And, and one of the things that we really lack today is discipline, discipline our kids, it's quiet in here. You don't think it's a problem? Go to Walmart. Just talking out loud for a second on a Sunday morning. Just saying. And, and we have a responsibility to teach it. Why? Because God established authority. And when you cross authority, you're really crossing God. And that's what Romans 13 says. In fact, the, the, the original authority that God's given us is the family. The family is, is the basis of society. And, and that's why whenever I'm talking to people, I always say parents outrank pastors. You know, our job, God entrusted your children to you, not to me. My job is to come alongside and help you be the best parents you can be, best disciple you can be. Sometimes some of the folks in the church will ask me questions and say, hey, what do you think about this with my kid? And, and I'm like, well, if it's a black and white biblical issue, then we got to keep it black and white. But a lot of the issues in our life are gray areas. They're not black and white. So, they, so I will say to them, I'm only going to tell your child what you would tell your child. I'm, you outrank me. I'm here to support you, and I will not tell your child something that you would not tell your child. I'm here to support you in that. I think it's just very important. So early on, we, we try to train our kids to pay attention to, you know, pay attention to um, who's in authority. So we ask our kids when they're in elementary school, who's in authority when you're at school? Our teacher is. That's right. Then who is your teacher's authority? Uh, that's the principal. Great. 
Who's your authority at church? The children's pastor is. Great. Who's your authority, you know, um, on the job? That's the boss. And just constantly trying to help them to recognize who's in charge and make sure you honor that. We firmly believe that it doesn't matter whether the president that's in the office today, whether you voted for them or not, we still honor the position of the president of the United States. We are responsible to honor the positions, and sometimes the people we don't respect, but we still have to show honor because of the position, or you find yourself at crossways with God, and we don't want that. So we always tra- train the, the boys, and we be, pay attention. Who's in charge? Who's in authority? And one day, uh, our kids went to play with some other kids at their house, and Hayden Luke came back, and he, he always was a teaching moment. He always had so many, he has so many stories. And he came back, and he's like, Dad, he said, there's something strange going on at that house. I'm like, what's going on? He says, you won't believe it, but the woman's in charge. I said, son, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it works like that, but good job noticing who's in charge at that house over there. That, that, that's important to know right there. Yes. Does their daddy know yet? <laughs> that's a million-dollar question right there. It is. So here's the deal. Um, I, you know, Amy said it a little bit ago, and I'll just reiterate it. Um, there's a time when we've got to take our kids and trust God, trust them with God. Our kids don't belong to us. They belong to him. He's letting us steward them for a little while, but they existed in the heart of God before he formed them in their mother's womb, before he gave them to us to steward. And before one day he'll call us home and they're here on their own. We must trust our kids with God. I love your rope analogy. We must trust our kids to God. And some of us struggle with that. We want to control everything to make sure nothing goes wrong. But here's the crazy thing. Who has a harder job? Us to trust God with our kids or him to trust his kids to us? I mean, he's the one that's out on the limb by giving them to us, right? He knows we're not perfect parents and we make mistakes. Some of the best parenting we ever did was make mistakes and let God clean it up. You know, so we have to trust them with God. One story, Tina and I, um, Caleb, Caleb, our oldest, well, he's 25, he's in Houston. By the way, parents, when they begin to release, when you begin to release that rope, um, for some kids, it's an event. It happens overnight. And for some, it's a process. I remember the week Caleb went to Western Carolina University, his first week at Western that first weekend, he says, by the way, me and my buddies are going to Atlanta to a, con- to a concert. We're spending the whole weekend down there. And I said, hey, 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 aren't we going to talk about this? He's like, no, I'm a man. I'm out of the house. I'm making my own decisions. We, we, this was an event. And, 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 a, and a year later, when he got a, a summer internship in Houston and went down there for the summer, and they offered him a full-time job, and he took it, it was it was. It was gone. He's never lived here again. I mean, at 18, he's living in Houston. I mean, it was that. It was an event. Hayden's still floating around at 23. <laughs> He'll be at lunch today or something. He'll just swing by. And he's, he's a process. He, this, you know, he, he's still trying out his wings, you know, <laughs> making sure they work before he leaves. Caleb was an event. So Caleb at 2 would stand here with his drumsticks in his hands and just stand in front of that drum and beat in the air during worship. At five, he got his first drum kit and he started playing drums back in children's church. A couple years later, he's playing with the youth. And then after a couple years after that, he's on the worship team. For 10 years, that boy would get up every Sunday morning and he would come in here at 7.30 in the morning and stay with me for five or six hours. And I got to share the platform with my son for 10 years. I mean, faithful. We have two teams. We have a red team and a blue team, so we alternate back and forth. And, and he was like on the red team playing drums. But then when the blue team needed a bass player, he was on the blue team. So he played almost every single week. He loved to play. He didn't care. He loved to play. And we hired a new worship pastor. And during that period, um, when we hired the brand new worship pastor, it was the same week that Caleb was supposed to do orientation at Western and so I said, son, you're taking the week off. You're, you're not going to be here. You're going to go to Western. You're going to do your orientation. You know, go have fun. Go be an adult. Go do that. And, and, and so the new worship pastor came in on the first Sunday that that boy had missed in years, years. 
And, um, and so Caleb was gone. The new worship pastor came in. And he said, you know, this, this, I don't know any of the personalities. I don't know the way people play. We've got two teams here, and it's going to take a while to get my feet on the ground. I really just want one team a, a team that I can work with and really get our act together, then we can grow it from there. So he picked the people on the first team, and he did not pick Caleb. He's been here a week. That boy had been here 17 years, playing for 10 years. And Tina says, what are we going to do about that? And I said, nothing. Because sooner or later, he's going to get passed over. He's going to have to learn how to deal with it. We're not raising boys, we're raising men. And sooner or later, he's going to get a church hurt. Sooner or later, a pastor's going to step on his toes. This is the safest place for him to fall, for him to fail, for him to throw a fit, is in his home church with us to love on him. But soon, I can't protect him forever. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Sooner, God, only God could have arranged for his first orientation be the first week of the new worship pastor and all that go down. And you know what? He survived, and he did fine, and he's thriving, and he's a full-time musician in Houston today. He's okay. He, he made it through it. And sometimes his parents were just like trying so hard to control everything and make sure that they get what they deserve and that nobody takes advantage of them. But you know what? Life's not like that. So somehow we're going to have to trust him. We did. We, it was hard for us. But you know what I said? We just hired a new worship pastor, and the worship pastor is an authority. And whether we like it or not, he's going to have to learn to submit to authorities. And if the authority sits him down for a season, he's going to have to trust that God's big enough to make up for that somewhere else. And he has, and he did, and we survived as a family, and he survived. We have to be careful that we don't protect our kids from God. I know of a parent that has resources, and their teenage son would go do something and get in trouble and they would use their resources to get them out of trouble. And they'd go wreck a car and they'd go buy them a new car. And they would do this over and over all throughout high school and all throughout college. And one day my pastor had to go to that father and said to them, if you don't stop bailing them out, God's gonna put them in a problem so big you can't bail them out and do you really want your son in that big of a problem? At some point, we gotta trust God and release them to God and say, he had them first. They're his kids. He's a big God, and he will work this out. We like to say this, this too will pass. This too will pass. There was a skinny jean season, but it passed. There was. You know, <laughs> the, 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 there was the jeans down over. But it's gone. But it's gone. There was a day. There was a day that was disco, but it, it, that too has passed, right? Right? I, I'm, I'm just saying God's a big God. So, so it's coming back. It might. So, so what we want to say is we're not experts. What we want to say is that we've walked through pain, disappointment. We've walked through embarrassment. We've walked through making horrible mistakes. I can't tell you how many times I've had to apologize to our sons. Tina was the one that sat with them on the bed late at night. Um, and captured those moments, I wasn't there. And it's one of the regrets I have in my life. I'm grateful that today we have good relationship with our sons, but some of the best parenting we ever did was mess up and watch God fix it and watch them, God, our God become their God yes. and not have to have us. So I want to just challenge us. This is, a, this, is a, this is a, we need the whole family to be part of this. You know, they're single moms that are struggling to have a positive male role model speak into their kids' lives. There's, there's families that are all alone, and, and that's why God created the church, is so that the, the lonely, the orphan, the widow, there, there's a place for all of us to come together. And so today we wanted to make sure we talked about that in front of everybody because everyone in the room has a place. If you are a male and if you have fathering skills, there are so many young people in this church that really needs a male to speak into their life. And one of the things you can do is speak identity. You can help them show, you can help celebrate the beauty and brilliance of one of these young people. It just, just, it just, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take a lot. It takes intentionality. Yes. It says, hey, every time I come to church, I'm going to look for that one and I'm going to tell them how brilliant and beautiful and how good a job they did. We can do that. And we just got to be a little more intentional about that, okay? 
Papa, I ask that you'd help us learn how to do this really well so that our little ones grow up without the troubles that we walk through. I pray, Father, even our mistakes we would redeem and make the enemy pay by teaching them to our children so they don't make the same mistakes. I pray for the successes we've learned that we wouldn't die, they wouldn't die with us, but we'd pass them on to another generation. I thank you, Father, that even when we've made mistakes, you are faithful and true to make up for those and redeem those. So, Father, I'm just asking right now as we get ready to close out this service, if there's any families here, if there's any people here today that, 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 that have a burden for their family, there's something going on, they need help, they need wisdom, they're overwhelmed, I ask, God, that you would pull on their hearts to come to you and let you answer those prayers. And I pray, Father, that you would cause us to be able to raise up healthy families in this church. And I thank you for your grace that you're giving us. And thank you for the joy and the celebration in the room this morning. We love to celebrate the uniqueness of each other. And that makes me happy. Great. Thank you for you doing that in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name.